Let's talk about research funding. Welcome to That's Academic. My name is Stephen Thompson. I'm delighted to be joined in this episode by Professor James Chalmers. He is the Regis Professor of Law at the University of Glasgow. Now, he and I are going to be discussing research grants and research funding, some of the ins and outs of how the grant system works, but also the pressures and the considerations that it generates both for academics and for institutions. James, it's so good to see you. Thanks a lot for speaking to me today. Oh, thanks for having me. James, we're talking today about research grants and research funding. Now, just for beginners, let's start with a nice kind of easy uh, lead into this. Just for the beginners out there, obviously this will vary from discipline to discipline, but could you run us through perhaps some of the more common budgeting items when you're applying for a research grant. In other words, what are some of the things that you're asking for money for in order to conduct your research? Yeah. Well, I, as you say, it's, it's going to be from discipline to discipline, and, and you are, and I are coming at this from, from a legal background. The, the key point um, in any application is, is going to be time and, and what time is going to be paid for. But there, what matters is looking at what the, the funder that you're going to apply for is willing to fund. So for, for some people, what matters most in any research funding application is getting time to do research personally. And some funding schemes don't fund that. They fund things that are additional to the, the work that you're doing for your own employers. They might fund research assistance, they might fund, fund travel and, and, and accommodation and so on. So it, it, it all depends on the scheme. But you're, you're looking largely for the kind of research that you and I would do about things like your own time and therefore effectively buy out from uh, other things that, that you might be doing uh, if you have a permanent job. You might, of course, be looking for, for funding to, to fund continued work, but you're not in that situation. It might be another person's time in the form of, of research assistance or for certain sorts of pro projects and administrative support and travel and accommodation, not that MD is uh, doing much of that right now. Beyond that, um, a lot will be discipline to discipline. So applications uh, in an area like law don't tend to involve very much by way of equipment. It's, it's not impossible. I've, been involved in uh, applications where one budget line was a, was a software license for a particular program, uh, for, uh, for example. You might, uh, in some situations, be looking at um, buying books for research, although normally those funders would say, well, your, your university library is going to provide those, those for you. Uh, we're not buying uh, complicated equipment. Obviously, in uh, other disciplines, equipment is, is going to become uh, m m much more important. But but time for most people, uh, in at least in our area, is always going to be the main thing. Yeah, and so when we talk about teaching buyout, I mean, what we're basically saying is you're being relieved from teaching duties either wholly or partly, and then we're using that funding to pay someone else to basically, as a substitute for your teaching, right? Essentially, yes. And this, this could operate in different ways. There are some funders where what is being offered, what is available to apply for, is replacement teaching. So a, a obvious example of that in, in the UK context would be the Leverhulme Trust, who will fund fellowships and pay for replacement teaching, but not paying your salary. And that, therefore, makes it a, a cheaper funding award to, to offer because they're usually paying for the cost of somebody uh, at a relatively junior level to, to cover a range of teaching. Other funding bodies, such as the, the research councils in, in the UK, would be paying for the cost of, of your time. And therefore, the more senior you are, the, the more expensive uh, that, that becomes. How that then gets managed is then up to an individual university and, and department. But obviously, in principle, if your time is being paid for by an external body, uh, whether that be a, a research funder or indeed anything else, that should reduce the amount of time that you have to do what would be your, your normal job and with it uh, reducing the amount of, of teaching or administration work that, you, that you're being asked to do. But that sort of funding is not a direct research uh, bias in that way, but it should have that, that effect. Again, an awful lot of, of the implementation here can, can be tricky and come down to individual university policies and practices. Yes. So, I mean, really, we're looking at 
sort of teaching buyout, you know, paying for the time, paying for someone else's time in terms of research assistance, um, equipment of some form or another, software licenses perhaps, maybe database access, um, open access fees. I mean, maybe in our field that's not so common, but still, actually, even some of the journals which are owned by large publishers, of course, those journals are not necessarily open access, but you can pay a few thousand pounds to make it open access. Yeah. So I guess that can be a budget. Yes, yeah, so that, 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 that's something uh, that, that, that I didn't mention. That will be something that's increasingly with, with some funding bodies is a condition, uh, actually, as, as part of the funding scheme, that if you are carrying out publicly funded research, and there's an increasing move towards this, the fruits of your research ought to be available to people for free and not hidden in a walled garden somewhere. Now, um, UK research councils have been over uh, some years now moving increasingly towards that position, but also making funding uh, available for it. With other funding schemes, it will be a question of what the funder is, is willing to pay for. So some may make that a condition and, and say, research should be just has to be open access and, and we will provide funding funding for that. Other funders uh, may not be willing to pay publication fees and, and, and simply it's then a question of you make your research available as best you can. In the UK, we, we have reached a, a reasonably good position in, in terms of open access where because of the ref and because publishers cannot get people to largely publish with them unless their outputs could be eligible in, in the ref, the ref requires that material that you're pub publishing um, is going to be available uh, in, in an open access format. So not what might be called gold open access, where the, the journal article is just available in its final form for free, but at least the accepted version after a window period should be available freely to down download from, from an institutional repository. So that, that as well can, can be a, an element. Uh, and it's going to become an increasing uh, element because of, of, of current research council policy, potentially for, for monographs uh, uh, as well. So in the past, we've thought of open access as largely something that is an issue for um, research articles. But the research council has started to say, well, if, if again you're getting public money to write a book, that book ought to be something anyone can read without paying what are often very high prices uh, for for an academic monograph. So there is this this push towards making research as freely available as possible. But publishing remains an extremely profitable industry, and the current solution of paying the publishers more money to make the things freely available is, is, is not perhaps going to change that anytime soon. You, you've, I think, hit on a really interesting paradox or tension there because open access is a good thing. I mean, I'm sure we both agree on that. And, and many scholars do, most of us, I, I suppose. Um, so on the one hand, it's obviously good if there is a push towards more open access. And, you know, I think in principle, it's a good thing that, you, that the funder says, well, we're only going to fund you if you make this open access. But then, of course, as you say, in order to make it open access, often, now I know you, you've got SSRN and other you know, repositories like that. But in terms of the final published version, in order to make it open access, you then have to use that money, which could be public money, to pay for the open access. There's, there's a tension there, right? Because we, we, it's then costing more money in order to make it open access. So I'm not for a second disputing the advantages of things being open access. I'm a, I'm a massive supporter of that. But is that actually becoming more expensive? Is it making research funding more expensive because you're then having to pay for these open access fees as a budgeting item? It, it, it is making some funding more expensive, although I think the reality still is that with, with most funders, this is not something um, in the arts humanities type subjects that you're going to get covered anyway outside the research council in, environment. So from that point of view, it's, it's not making much difference in most cases to what people are uh, applying for. What we are going to have to see over the, the next uh, years or, or, or decades in academic publishing is possibly universities taking a, a bit more responsibility for the publishing side to try and, and break down the very high cost uh, ecosystem that, that has developed with academic publishing. And, and you, you do see some universities moving towards setting up things like their own 
open access presses. And so much, of course, what pushes people towards very costly options in publishing for understandable reasons is the prestige of who you're publishing with. And, and the fact that your re research is likely to get more attention if you're publishing with a, an, an imprint or with, with, with a journal, uh, which is recognised as, as being uh, a leading one in that field. So then, on one level, if you're being very uh, blasé about it, open access is, is, is easy. You just stick something up uh, on your own institutional repository or, or, or a subject repository. Um, but there's a number of problems with that, of course. It doesn't help uh, it, it get attention. And you know, publishing um, isn't, although we, we do talk about what well, academics are doing, all, all, all the copy editing uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, publishing is still a, a professional business where it can be done well or, or it can be done badly. Um, you sticking something up uh, on, on a PDF uh, on your own institutional repository and doing nothing else is not going to get noticed. It's probably not going to be very well, well copy edited, very well presented. And you understand that if you take a lot of time and effort into research, you, you want the results of that to be a be as high quality uh, as they can. But it is striking how um, slow the, the change, uh, or how slow the, the process of change in publishing ha has been and how your publishers are um, an industry that have, have really done fantastically. So you know, we, we have, of course, in, in the UK at the moment, huge disputes uh, of coming down the line about security of, of, of our pensions and um, really clearly what for the moment the pension fund should be investing in is academic publishing because that, that, that's where the real money is right now. No, absolutely but we're not giving investment advice right. Um, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> the, the, the value of your shares in the publisher may go down, may as, go well. down as well as up that's true. Um, these are excellent points I, I would like to maybe approach it now from a little bit of a different direction because um, if you're applying for all of this money, whether it's, now it could be lab equipment or something. I think if you're in, I'm generalizing of course, but if you're in industries where you need to buy, I don't know, expensive equipment, you know, some kind of radiography machines or something, I don't want to embarrass myself by, by trying to name these things. But in our discipline, generally speaking, you, you don't need this money as much for your research. And it will vary between people, of course, because some people will be conducting maybe empirical research, which requires additional support, or some people might need a software license. I'm not saying that there's no one in a kind of non-physical science subject who needs the money. But if you don't need the money, um, isn't it a good thing that you're not applying for grants? Because especially if the money's coming from public funds. So if I can do my research without costing tens of thousands of pounds or even more, isn't that a feather in my cap rather than saying, oh, look, I secured a grant for a million pounds? Because what that really says is, you know, this guy's awfully expensive. It, it may say that, um, but I suppose the defence of, of the, this kind of research fund, funding system would be, look, this funding is enabling you to, to do the research quicker. Uh, and... And it's doing that by you going through a process of convincing um, a, a funder that the research is, is valuable and worth doing. And that is one of the advantages uh, or, or one of the things that perhaps, let's not say an advantage, but less detrimental about, about these research funding systems where you're doing that, that kind of research in that the work you have to put into designing a project to designing a research funding a application is work you can, in many cases, avoid wasting. So research funding might be the difference between if I get this funding, I can do this big project in, in three years. If I don't get this funding, I'm still going to do it, but I'll, I'll either cut it down to something more manageable and less ambitious, or I'll do it all over a, a longer time frame. So that is, is, is a very privileged position if, if you're doing that kind of research, which, which is most of what, what you and I do. If you are um, involved in a field where the research funding determines whether you could do the research or not, because you're not going to be able to hire the research assistants, you're not going to be able, able to, to buy the uh, scientific equipment to, to, to do it or pay, or pay for the lab time, then, then that is obviously um, a rather different matter. The The reality of, of the situation we, we work with, of course, is that, it, that there are lots of people who would like, like to say, well, I, I just like to be allowed to get on with my, with my research and, and not have to worry about all these funding applications. But of course, employers are very keen and uh, institutions are, are very keen on, on people getting funding for, for reasons of prestige, but it's not merely a, a, a branding exercise. Getting funding to pay for your time to do research should, uh, in, 
unless um, you're, you're somebody who has infinite time to stretch into. It should result in that, that research being done sooner. It should result in that research being done to, to a high quality. If it's research that is really valuable research, that, that should be a, a good thing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I know that can be frustrating for, for a lot of people who think, well, I've, I've now got uh, a, a permanent job. I've, I've got some time to do research, maybe not always as much as, much as I'd like, but I'd just like to, to get on with it without uh, without worrying about it. But there are always going to be incentives, um, either at a personal level or an institutional level, to, to apply for that funding. I'm so glad you raised this point about the the what's in it for the institution or why does the institution want, want us to do this? Again, we're not talking so much here about research which, which requires the funding you know, in order to be conducted because that's, that's kind of obvious, yeah. that's self-explanatory. But for research that doesn't necessarily require it, I mean, you've put forward the, the, the proposition that it kind of speeds up the research or, or um, maybe enables it to happen more quickly. Is, is that actually true? I mean, is, it, is there a risk that it's actually taking time away from research in order to apply to do research which might end up being done or might end up being done later because you have to wait for, you know, some of these schemes can have you waiting for almost a year for a reply, right? Six to 12 months. Um, and and you, mentioned, you mentioned prestige as well. Unless, you know, unless again the research requires the funding, what is the point of this for institutions? Well, the, on, the, on the first part of that, I think there, there is a danger that, that you end up with a, a lot of work going in around the world to people applying to, uh, to funding schemes, often very competitive uh, funding schemes. And a lot of time, that, as you say, could be spent doing research, is spent on, on making applications. You, personally, in, in my own discipline, I, I don't feel that, that pressure quite so much. Now, that's maybe a privileged position because I'm, I'm in a secure and, and senior position. But I am in an environment where um, I think this is true of discipline generally. People are not churning out uh, applications all the time and spending their, their, their time primarily on writing grant applications rather than actually doing the research. My impression, but it's no more than that, is that in some other disciplines, the balance is, is tilted much further in that direction. And people are who often people who have secure positions, have time for research, are spending that research time. Um, much uh, to a much greater extent than, than is really healthy on, um, on on chasing the funding uh, rather than anything else. I, again, to, to the extent that this, this matters, one, one thing it can do depending on, on the scheme is, of course, carve out the time for concentrated eff effort. And this, this is something that matters more to some people than, than others. So if you have a scheme that allows people to actually spend most or all of their time over um, over a period working on a research project, that may allow for something that would be very difficult to achieve by saying, look, I, I've got an afternoon a week, I can put into to, to writing this book. Um, you know, for, 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 for some people in some areas, this idea of being able to immerse yourself in, in a research project is going to result in something much more valuable at, at the end of it than something else. And there, there's a difference between how people work. Some, some people can produce their, their, their best work juggling it with lots of other things. So, some people are, are going to um, benefit much more from the, the focus that this kind of funding uh, provides. Now, of course, that's not something which gets assessed in funding applications. I'm not sure how, how you would assess it. You know, are, are you a deep thinker who, who, who requires to lock themselves in the room with 100 books for six months to make progress on, on, on this? Or, or are you um, a, a more, I don't even know what, what, what the word would, would, would be, um, is your mind more flighty? Can, can, can you move from, from topic to topic easily and, and, and find your way back without, uh, without any difficulty? So there's some people will benefit more than others in that sense. I think in all cases you will benefit from being able to get something done quicker unless you're stuck in that cycle uh, of applying constantly uh, for, for funding to the extent of, of, of not doing research. As I say, I think that's much more of a problem in some disciplines than it is in others. Very interesting points, James. Um, one of the phenomena that we're seeing, of course, in academia is we're seeing more kind of fixed term positions coming through. Now, obviously, um, in in systems with tenure, people always almost always start in fixed term contracts anyway. But in non tenure systems, like in the UK, for example, um, certainly I've seen in our discipline a lot more kind of fixed term contract positions coming through. Now, for those people, are they not placed at a real disadvantage here? And and, and aren't the institutions trying to kind of 
have their cake and eat it because on the one hand they're saying well you need to have this research funding you know it's it's necessary to be hired for some other position or some promoted post but on the other hand we're hiring you know increasing numbers of people it's still the minority but increasing numbers of people on fixed term contracts who are perhaps disadvantaged because they're not necessarily able to build in the time that's necessary to make the application, which could take six to 12 months. And then what if they want to run, let's say, a two to three year uh, project after that? So are, are institutions trying to, are they expecting too much of people in that kind of situation? There's a, there's a huge difficulty in varying between disciplines it's just the, the extent to which people are expected to try and, and, and build careers. Often it's a, you know, I would say fairly, fairly advanced age. I'm not, I'm not sure somebody in the late 20s would, would uh, take kind of being told they're of advanced age, but at the time when people are, are usually setting, uh, settling down and making routes to a particular location and being told, right, actually, you're, you're still um, in a situation where fixed term contracts are, are, are what you can get. And by the way, this may involve moving around the country or, um, or across the country in, in order to, to secure work. There's a place for, for fixed term contracts. And, and, and again, here I think you have disciplinary differences. It's, the situation, I think, again, in our own discipline of law has not typically been terrible in that most people working and teaching in, in, in law schools are on permanent contracts. And often fixed term co contracts work very effectively as a, a bridge to a, a first permanent contract. And I, I have seen this situation where people that have, have benefited from research funding because somebody has got a, a grant, has created uh, a fixed term, term post that they've got, and that fixed term post has become permanent or has, has been a basis for them to secure a permanent position e elsewhere. But that's perhaps a, a slightly complacent answer and one that works in a discipline where there is still a good supply overall of, of permanent, at least entry level, level posts because of the, the volume of, of students and also a relatively low supply of, of PhD graduates across the board because uh, still of, of the push um, that people who do law degrees generally want to go into practice. They don't want to, uh, to go on and, and do research qualifications. But the situation looks much worse in disciplines where you have a much uh, greater supply uh, of PhD graduates, a smaller supply of permanent positions, and, and people therefore do get stuck um, often on fixed term contracts for a very long period of time, or being unable to find even you know, a, a full term fixed a fixed term contract might be very attractive, but instead scrabbling together different bits of, of work often at, at, at different institutions, and that is. That's a problem that, that is difficult to solve because the, the, the problem fundamentally com comes down to there are not enough academic posts for the number of people who are qualified uh, for these academic posts. So it, it remains a, an attractive career until, <coughs> excuse me, until you hit the reality of, of trying to, to get that level of security, which is what most people want from an employer. Absolutely. And, and we're seeing that, so obviously there's time involved in, in making an application. Now that could be to a greater or lesser extent. But let's say that someone puts a lot of time and effort and energy into the creation of an application. Um, and they get their peers to comment and they get institutional support. Um, and it goes through a kind of, almost a kind of pre-peer review. And so there's a lot of effort and time put in. Then they submit the application. Um, the result comes back, let's say nine months later. And the result is, well, we're terribly sorry, your application was excellent, but Resources are limited. We could only select a small number of projects and yours wasn't one of them. Um, you know, cheerio, sorry. Um, what do we do about that? I mean, how do, we, how do we compensate academics for time lost, some would say wasted, on applications which were not successful, not because not enough work would tend to them or, or they weren't good enough somehow, but, you know, just there was a limited number of slices that could be cut from the pie and there wasn't enough to give them, you know, uh, part of that allocation, uh, the resource allocation. What can we do about that? I mean, in terms of maybe performance appraisals, but also in terms of if a person's then trying to get a job somewhere else, maybe move somewhere else, you know, they can hardly put on their CV, well, I applied for a grant and, and I was rejected, but, but please take into account the fact that I applied for one. What can we do about that and what can institutions do about that? Well, a number of different things. To take the last point 
point first. Um, it's not necessarily a terrible thing to say that you've applied for a grant that you were rejected for if what you've got is a, bit, a very high rating or, or grading on that grant. Now, that will depend, again, on, on the funding scheme that you're applying to. Some funding schemes will simply say, you didn't get it. Some, some funding schemes will, will come back telling people this was fundable, that this was a high priority for funding, but lots of things were, and, and you didn't make the cut. So there may be situations in which not clearly not as good a line to have your CV as getting the funding, but there may be situations in which uh, the, it's, it's worth um, pointing out that, that you have put the time to do that, you have got the skill, the ability and experience to create a, a good funding application. But let's not pretend that's a good answer to, to that problem. What institutions, I think, have to do primarily here is, first of all, avoid putting pressure on people to, to repeatedly apply over and, and over again to schemes with a very low chance of success. So it's one thing to say, look, we expect you to make a big fund, funding application or a funding application um, every so often, um, but actually your primary primary job here is to produce research alongside your teaching and administration. It's another thing to uh, to say, right, we expect you to be churning these things out constantly in the hope that if you throw enough uh, darts at the dartboard, you, you, you'll get a triple 20 sooner or later. That, that's clearly not uh, a healthy situation to be in. And in fact, increasingly funding bodies, particularly the, in the UK, the funding councils, are expecting that institutions will apply a level of, of demand management and, and not... Uh, put in uh, as many applications as possible to try and maximise winning grants through, through luck more than anything else. So you, you can get the situation uh, where uh, interest will be told, look, if, if you keep on giving us applications that are up, up to scratch, you, you might not be allowed to apply uh, anymore in future. There will be um, attempts to try and, and manage demand in, in that way. But this is something which... The, the ideal situation, I, I suppose, would be to recognise this is something that we, you expect most academics are going to do every so often, but you don't expect that the, the top priority is going to be uh, applying for, for funding rather than, that, than producing the research. And also, potentially, if we talk about the, the, the time involved, this can vary a lot depending on what it is you're, you're applying to. Some sorts of funding application can be easier to put together than, than others. And one thing institutions can do if, if, if they are running a workload allocation model or, or similar system is say, look, if you're willing to put, put yourself forward for this scheme, which takes a lot of preparation, a lot of work to put together a good application, that's that's part of your job and, and we will allocate time to you in order to do that. Um, again, a, a lot comes back to the point I was making earlier that I, if you're in, involved in the ideal of putting together a project where you can get something out of it regardless of the funding, even if it's not a full project, you can avoid wasting um, too much time in that process. Clearly, the skill you develop in writing a budget is, is, is not going to help you don't get, get the funding. But the intellectual um, element of putting the academic proposal together can be something that, that, that will pay off down the line. But that is obviously very different where it's a project where you have to say, I cannot do this unless I get the funding. And, and there, that can be very demoralising because the, the work can just be wasted um, further down the line. Yeah. Well I wonder if I can just ask a final question on this before we come to the, the stock question that I always finish with. Um, and it's just to return to this idea of why. Why are institutions expecting this? Again, I'm not speaking here about areas of research which require the funding in order for the research to be conducted. Um, are faculties and departments which are expecting their staff to apply for these research funds doing it simply because senior management and institutions are forcing them to do it? Or is it a case of the prestige factor, as you say, it's, well, we can, you know, put in our news page, um, here are three members of staff who secured, you know, enormous grants. Um, I, I'm just still not clear about what's, what, what is the purpose of this? I mean, and that's not, that's not through not understanding how it works or not having thought about it. I just, I'm always left with this sense that the cart seems to be before the horse. I just don't, there's something about it I yeah. don't get. Well, I think, that, I think the instinct for a lot of academics uh, is that the research gets, gets done anyway. We've all, we're all employed, we, we, we get time to do re research if we've got permanent positions, and uh, that therefore the funding isn't is really changing the fact that, that we're doing research. One way of looking at it, uh, which I'm, I'm, will not necessarily appeal, but I remember a university minister I, I was speaking to who didn't have a background in, in academia, a background in finance, and did talk about the research order book. 
And you know, they, their their approach to this, their, their instinct was was just this is like you know we're, we're running a factory. I don't mean this in a negative sense. We're running a factory selling widgets. And we've got all these research grants, and it's great. People are buying more of our widgets. People think that our widgets are top quality, and they're therefore giving us the resource to produce even even more of them. So I think that is the, the best defence you, you can make of the situation, beyond just the, the, the personal benefit that may accrue to, to a researcher, that look, this is allowing more research to take place in a particular institution that would otherwise take place. They might, you might be cynical about that and say, but, but when you take it account all the time people spent applying for this, actually how, how much extra time uh, are, are you really getting? But but that, I think, is the, is the, the defence uh, of, of the research funding situation. Uh, more widgets are being produced as a result of the funding. And if we think our research is important, if we think our research is valuable, that's a good thing. If actually we don't think our research is important and valuable, then that, that's a different matter. But then we should all give up and go home. You know the research order book. That's that's demoralising. <laughs> I've never heard that term <laughs> yeah, before. I, and I, we're going to like it. I hope I never hear it again. Goodness, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's that's an, an interesting insight. But but it's, it's based on the it's based on the idea that this is stuff that you know, it's good to make. It's good to sell. It's, well, let's say precisely. Let's not let's not say sell. Uh, and, and therefore, if we get the, um, the facility to do more of it, that that's a good thing. It's interesting though that you say you, you know assuming we find our research valuable or meaningful. And I know you do and I do too, but I mean, I personally know people who have been under enormous institutional pressure to secure research funding. They've you know, put together projects that they otherwise wouldn't have done and which they regard as less valuable and meaningful than the research they would otherwise have done, which would not have required grant applications. Then they go into the research projects, they, they get the funding, they're fortunate to get the funding, they go into the research project and then, you know, time's running out at the end. There's a deadline by which they have to submit a report. And now they're just looking to publish it anywhere. And they end up publishing it in some, you know, fairly mediocre journal simply because that journal's desperate to get any, you know, to publish anything and to push anything out as quickly as possible. Um, and then they can say, well, box ticked. Now you've got your, your research grant and you've successfully completed. You know, that, that's, that's not healthy, right? Is it? It's not. So, and one thing that that again, you and I are in a relatively privileged position here is that most research um, in our area can be described perhaps as as, as curiosity driven, uh, in in the sense that you are given the opportunity to decide what you think is is, is worth researching. That's not being directed. Uh, most people in, in law are independent researchers from a very early stage in, in their career, as opposed to being researchers at other, other people's projects. Most funding schemes are, are curiosity driven. Um, and, and there, there's, a, there's a technical term for this, which is not that, I forget what the technical term is, but you decide what a uh, project is, is worth funding. You make the case uh, and um, a decision is, is made accordingly. But as funding schemes uh, move more towards we want to fund particular bits of research, we want to fund particular types of research. There's always the, the possibility that, that, you know, that people to secure funding find themselves, themselves doing projects that actually they, they don't particularly want, want to do. And that, I suspect, is a, is a much greater issue in some disciplines uh, than, than others. Um, it can, of course, be, be an issue in any discipline if people feel they need to tailor what it is that, that they want to do to what they, they believe a funder's uh, agenda is. That again, in, in UK with the major funders for the kind of stuff that you, you and I do, that I think is not an enormous issue. Uh, people may perceive it as an enormous issue. People, of course, may make reasonable judgments about, well, what I'd really like to do is, is X, but I don't think I can actually convince somebody that X is a really valuable thing to do. So if I want funding, the, the project should, should actually look, look like Y. Um, but, but that's not a major factor of uh, a, ma a major element of our, our funding landscape, but certainly not um, desirable if people are, especially developing projects, not because they think they're valuable, but because they think somebody else think, thinks they're valuable, and they're being funded because a funder thinks, well, this person thinks this is valuable, and, and I agree with them. At that stage, the, the ecosystem has has broken down completely, and that, that's not a good, a good position to be in. My own experience, uh, an experience I think of, of people I work with directly, is... is is an environment where that really isn't happening to any great extent, but I, I hear what you're saying that 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 may not be true elsewhere. F fascinating insights. Probably my own insights are also, uh, what should I say, tainted by the fact I was in a jurisdiction which had a lot more, um, how should I say, political 
um, political pressure or, or maybe expectations which which can impinge upon the kinds of research expectations that they were. But so these things can vary from from, from country to country and system to system, right? Um, James. The UK, for, for all the academics, would be very, very critical of, of the UK government in, in, in lots of ways. The research fund, funding system uh, is set in ways that I think we, we don't sometimes appreciate that really do um, keep political pressures, by and large, out of that. So the, the, there have been other jurisdictions. I think Australia has seen that in, in recent years where politicians have, have chosen to take mu a much greater interest in what can, should be, and, and is funded. And actually, if you're applying to the major government funding bodies here, like the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the government is pretty hands off with that, and I don't think we'll appreciate that until we lose it. And we we could lose it at some point. I don't, I don't think it's under threat, but I, I think we, we won't notice the benefit of what we've got uh, until a time comes, if it does, when we no longer have that. That's a really fair point. Really fair point, uh, James. That's fascinating. I would like to conclude with just a standard question which I'm putting to all guests um, on this channel, and that is, if you could change one thing about academia, what would it be? And I hope you've had a chance to think about this. Uh, I have to, I have the chance to think about it. It doesn't mean it's a good answer. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the, the point I was making earlier, perhaps, about, about fixed-term contracts and, and, and security. One thing I, I would like to see is in um, PhD funding and recruitment of PhD students, more emphasis placed on is this uh, a field where there's like to be a job at, at the end of it? So at the moment, if we, we have a situation where I think from the perspective of people coming into law, for, for example, as PhD students, the, the job market can, can look terrible. In many respects, it, it is. From the perspective of a lot of departments hiring people, it can look the opposite because actually you're quite often trying to recruit people to cover uh, lots of subjects where there aren't many PhD graduates and not very many applicants for jobs, but there are some fields where, where there are, are far more. And this is the kind of issue you, you see um, across the board and play it in different ways in, in, in lots of different subjects. And one thing that's always struck me as, as, as very odd is if I'm making an application for um, funding in the PhD scheme, there's lots of points in that for, for saying, look, this person will join a thriving community of lots of other PhD students. Whereas actually the point should really be there for saying, there are no other PhD students working in, in this area, but you know what, that's great because this person will be, be in a much better position to, to get a job at, at the end of this. Now, that's... A, a fundamentally larger problem, which is it would be better to have a situation where there was better alignment uh, without turning this into a, a planned economy of some sort between people coming into to PhD programmes and employment options at the end of that. And some, some of that could just be more employment opportunities. Some of that could be trying to direct um, PhD, PhD study in a more effective way. But of course, that comes down to the fact that uh, fundamentally, when it comes to studying for a PhD, people do have their own choices and their own interests as, as, as to what they want to do. And it's all very well if, if I say, but nobody ever, do, if, if ever does subject X, you'll be really well placed to get, get a job out after that. But somebody say, yes, but the reason nobody does subject X, or at least my reason for not doing subject X, is I don't like it. I, I, I don't find it interesting. But something that, that avoids the, the, the situation we have created or tries to minimise it, where there is just this, this mismatch uh, in the supply of, of, of graduates and, and, and law in both directions and, and the job market would, would I think make life less painful for a lot of people. You've got me thinking, so there, there are actually, if someone is choosing their, their research topic for their PhD, obviously they shouldn't base this on just strategy or tactics, they have to be interested in it, otherwise morale is going to be a problem and, and all the rest of it. But the advantages if there are a number of people already working in an area, there, there's probably a reason for that. It can be an area which is maybe cutting edge, maybe an area that's just fashionable. I mean, I think of something like fintech or something. Everyone now wants a fintech person. Um, but on the other hand, so, so, so people who then go into those fields, if, there are, you know, if the supply becomes too large in terms of PhD graduates in those fields, it can, you know, people can have a harder time securing um, a suitable job in that area. But on the other hand, if someone chooses a much more kind of niche or unusual topic, they don't necessarily face so much competition, but then is a job going to come up which allows them to continue in that niche? There are almost kind of competing factors and considerations there, right? Yeah, I, I certainly, I, I don't think the finding a narrow niche is, this, 
necessarily a, a good strategy. But what law schools tend to find is, is that people working in often the core private law subjects, for, for, for example, there are fewer people doing uh, doctoral work in, in these areas. There are fewer people applying for jobs when they come up. By contrast, uh, if you are working in areas like international law or legal theory, uh, there are is a much greater supply of PhD graduates and a much greater number of applications for any given job. You, you have the advantage there, of course, that, that um, if you are personally mobile, that some areas are more, are more mobile than, than others and lend themselves more to, to applying to a, a broader range of jurisdictions for work. But fundamentally, people have to make their own choices uh, as to what they want to do. Uh, but we could, I suspect, always do a better, a better job of making it clear what the employment market is like and what the consequences are down the line. And somebody may say, look, I realise that this is going to be a, a difficult area to break into, but this is what I want to do. This is what, what I want to, to have, have a shot at. And that's fine as a choice for some, somebody to make. What you want to avoid is a situation where somebody um, goes into the, the, the process, and the PhD is a big commitment, thinking uh, that the, the job market down the line is going to be a, a lot stronger uh, from their point of view than that is actually the case. I think we, we could do a better job of that. I, I think people are generally quite good already at, at, at trying, trying to make that clear. But it's always something where there is room for improvement because fundamentally this is people's lives you're talking about. Absolutely. And one of my previous guests, um, Stuart Hargreaves, had said he would like to see uh, statistics on, you know, for all of our PhD graduates, where are they now? So almost kind of employ employment statistics for PhD graduates. But I can't imagine institutions being... Um, terribly happy to release those for some reason. Um, but James, it's yeah. been wonderful speaking to you and you know your insights as a, as a very senior academic are really valuable and really uh, valued. So thanks so much for your time and it's been great to speak to you today. Good speech as well. Thanks so much, James. Yeah, thank you. That was Professor James Chalmers, Regis Professor of Law at the University of Glasgow. I hope you found our discussion interesting and insightful. If you did, please consider subscribing or letting someone else who might benefit from these discussions know about the channel. Also consider liking the video and please do engage by leaving your comments. Thank you for listening to this episode and I'm looking forward to interviewing my next guest on That's Academic.